everyone, welcome to a new book review. This is the latest book by Hazel Sohn and it's called Learn to Paint Wildlife Quickly. So obviously it focuses on different animals and the medium is watercolor. Hazel is known for her watercolor paintings and I believe she does a number of different courses and I do have I think a few of her previous books or at least one for sure but I'm so excited to share this book it's been sent to me by the publisher Batsford in February as it's been freshly published this year 2023 so let's look inside so if you are an animal lover and you love watercolor this book might be for you so let's have a look inside. Oh, this is Caddy paper, watercolor on Caddy paper. And let's have a look at the contents. Chapter one, how to paint wildlife. Chapter two, techniques for speed. Chapter three, pose and proportion. Chapter four, surface detail, fur, feather, hair and markings. So quite often it is difficult to depict feathers and fur in watercolor because you don't have any other mediums so you have to learn certain techniques to be able to create those textures and so that is what chapter four is about chapter five we have light and coloring chapter six background and setting chapter seven back in the studio epilogue the thrill of the case and acknowledgements there's a little introduction here. If you're not familiar with Hazel, she is a successful artist and she kind of travels between London and Cape Town. And I guess this inspiration must have come from her travels. And you can see here just beautifully using watercolor and values to an effect to bring certain animals, oh, I suppose these are bulls probably, to bring them to the foreground and then push others into the background. And also working with perspective. We also have beautiful granulating watercolor here, which I can see. And there's some layering technique where she would wait for the color to dry completely and then go over with the next more solid layer and here for instance there is a gap because this must have been still wet both of those colors when painting so to avoid the merging and the mess because then obviously one or the other color would flow into another and you would lose it kind of would look like you know an animal with eight legs so sometimes you have to leave a gap if you are for instance inspired by a really granulating color and you don't want to wait you want to do it right now then you just need to add a little gap for the colors to not blend then there are some examples of postures and how to capture that moment so these are meerkats and if you've been at least to the zoo you would know how quick they move and how they also freeze once they stand looking out and listening out for some you know possible predators obviously there are no predators where they're in the zoo uh, but it's still within their genetic code to be aware of things and then speed and things so because we're talking about animals sometimes you can capture that perfect moment of the animals being there and just you know maybe eating something in one spot and not moving around much but generally animals do move around so um, then you can learn from um, these examples then there are outlines so as you always start with some sort of a sketch or not always but sometimes uh, it helps to perhaps study the the shape and the form before you go in with watercolor and this is why sketchbooks are super important watercolor pencils so she also has some examples with that 
the freshness of watercolour. Let me just read you out this bit here. It is possible to paint directly with the brush and watercolour, which makes for fast, lively paintings and often saves valuable time by eliminating the need to draw first. Some subjects benefit from a pencil guide to show the brush where it can safely go. Others can be painted without the aid of a guiding line. A pencil sketch colored with watercolor is a practical method for painting for shortened angles, portraits and complex scenes, but straightforward poses can be tackled directly with brush and paint. So as I mentioned before, if you're working on a complex movement or a scene, then perhaps working with a sketch beforehand helps. But like here, for example, capturing just the essence of the shape is enough to create that essence of the animal. And here we have some blue watercolors, which is quite pretty, almost looks like grass, but instead of the green, we have the blue, which works beautifully with the white of the zebras. Chapter two, techniques for speed. So here, Hazel will talk you through how to create activity within the animals, animal postures. So for instance, here a dog has an open mouth and it's breathing. So you'd imagine it's a hot summery day perhaps, or it's been running around. So then there is a lot of softness within the watercolor, which basically can suggest that the dog might be moving around. Here we have some birds that are standing still and also some birds above that are flying in all sorts of directions. So you can see sometimes the wings are down, sometimes the wings are up, sometimes there is a certain angle and no bird looks exactly the same. So doing this, you're creating an illusion of movement. So it's not static. It looks like you have taken a picture on your camera of a like a flying bird, for example. Painting wet into wet. So here are some water techniques, watercolor techniques that um, you can use and you can um, kind of play around and create some lovely textures and blends of the watercolor. Pose and proportion. So let's look into this section here heads or tails. Hazel predominantly is known for her loose watercolors. So she works a lot with um, kind of wet into wet and softening the lines. There's nothing too sharp in there, yet there is enough detail to suggest that those are branches and there's a bit of water and different textures of the ground without making it all bland and becoming one mass, like muddy mass in watercolor. So it's good to learn that. Springbok in the Kalahari. So there's different animals here. And the paper I can recognize in most cases, it looks like from the texture, it looks like the Kadi papers. So here is a great example of uh, creating layers. So in this example, there is a little bit of pencil markings and then the lioness has detail built layers by layers. Surface detail, fur, feathers, hair and markings. Now, like I said before, those things can be difficult to create with watercolor because you're just working with the brush, water and the pigments. So in this example here, dubbing a bit of what looks like possibly could be Mars black, which is super granulating into still wet paint, creates beautiful bloom and a blossoming effect, which then actually, if you look slightly from afar, it looks like fur because the edges of this circle are not straight. The other style would be more illustrative and this is kind of like a loose realism. 
fur and hair again using loads of blends making the watercolor blend and flow into one another for that softer effect as the lion's mane is super soft and gracious and very kind of you know fluffy and it is the king of the animals so by using these softer lines hazel created that beautiful element of the lion's mane again the brush marks just fur and here is what i was saying painting spots and you can see the difference between the uh, layer so spots can be applied in a variety of ways from top to bottom wet into wet dry brush and wet on dry so when you do the wet on dry you end up with sharper lines around and then you can have a different type of texture altogether by using dry brushing so hardly any water mostly pigment in the brush and then you will add a different texture it's more sharper and it's also more kind of irregular. It has less smoothness to it. And then we have feathers and tails. Feathers are really difficult to paint with watercolor only because like I said, very quickly you can just blend everything and you know, one wrong stroke of brush and you touch the wet with the other wet and it just all flows together and game over. So there are certain techniques that you can use like masking uh, fluid, for example, to maintain some of those sharper white areas. And then you can go over it as a safety tool to fall back onto if you need. And then we have these beautiful illustrations or paintings rather, light and coloring. So here we're talking about light, so you can see this part of the elephant is clearly in the shade whereas this side is being hit by the sun and so we have the shadow and the light beautifully demonstrating the hot climates of that part of the world where the animals can freely run around in the nature so we have that beautiful sun um, and it's probably a sunset because there isn't, or maybe sunrise, there isn't too much light there. Choosing colors. A limited palette of very few colors is often the best option for painting wildlife in situ so without confusing the painting too much where it's just maybe too much detail too much color reducing your color palette i'm all for it i love limited color palette paintings it just makes it more about the situation about the subject matter than everything else and you can kind of focus on that more useful colors of the wild so raw umber burnt sienna light red and burnt umber those seem to be the colors that hazel recommends to create beautiful earthy tones and then we have also here yellow ochre lizard and crimson and prussian blue if you wanted to add that depth and creating shadow within your paintings background and settings dark against light light against dark so of course painting a lot of elephants and creating an illusion of a herd is quite difficult because you have loads of layering to do you have to also then take into consideration the lighting situation the highlights and the shadows so there's a beautiful example here. The book is filled, as you can see, with loads of lovely examples. There's some step-by-step -step tutorials that you can follow to achieve those techniques. And you can learn quite a bit because there's a lot of 
um, text that goes, well not too much text, but enough text that goes to explain the techniques. This is such a beautiful painting, look at that. The colors are used in such an amazing way. There is enough detail, there is also enough looseness there, and although I'm not a like, I, I don't generally like purple, but this is where purple is used just to perfection as it's making that beautiful pop with the other softer yellow colors and earthy tones right there. And then the blue pops out as well, so we can see that the sun is shining. And this side is the shadow side, so everything just looks really, really beautiful. And I would say that this book is probably best suited to those who do love wildlife, who love animals and who love kind of not too much realism but creating or capturing the essence of that particular animal and I feel like you would learn a lot from this book so I will leave a link down below for convenience and thank you for watching, I'll see you next time.